Hello everyone and uh, good evening. Uh, topic of the day is uh, supercharged hiring with ESOP. And I'm sure uh, all of you would have uh, appreciated the role ESOP plays in uh, attracting, rewarding and retaining talent, top talent at your startups, right? Uh, we have here with us uh, uh, venture partner and founding coach at uh, um, Axel Partners, Narayan. Uh, welcome, Narayan, to this uh, session. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. So I am going to uh, talk about some of the basics of ESOP. And uh, before I hand over to Narayan and you know get started with uh, a more kind of uh, in-depth discussion on this topic, right? Uh, so as I was saying, ESOPs remain the most powerful way for you as founders to be able to attract, reward, and retain top talent. And I believe this is not just a powerful way, but the only way you as founders can align your uh, early, early employees to uh, you know, be part of your startup journey and be part of the growth at your, uh, at your company. Uh, these early stage employees do take a lot of risks in terms of joining you at, at early stages. And they need to get rewarded non-linearly, as we call it, right? At the end of the day, uh, as you as founders also, you know, uh, get a reward uh, during any exits or whatever uh, that happens, right? And these employees being participating in that journey also get rewarded in a similar multiples, but of course at a smaller level. So that makes it very more, very much powerful uh, ESOPs as a tool. Now, I guess uh, many of you would be, you know, India registered uh, startups, some of you may be US registered, right? So I will explain some of the terms that are applicable in the ESOP world for some of the India companies, US companies, and so on. Uh, in India, all of us, uh, you know, use the term ESOP very much, right? And uh, there is another term called SAR, stock appreciation rights that is used, right? Whereas in US, I have seen, uh, you know, instead of ESOP, they are called more uh, as stock options. I mean, they are one and the same thing, but their stock options is the term that is what is used more, more often in, in, in US. You would have also seen a term called RSA, RSUs, phantom stocks being used as well. Uh, and these are equivalent to SAR. I will explain, you know, how they dif differ a little bit in terms of uh, uh, nuances. Uh, some of these are cash-based uh, incentive mechanisms, whereas um, stock options and um, uh, you know ESOPs uh, remain as an equity-based incentive mechanism, right? So, uh, in terms of RSAs and RSUs, uh, we have seen uh, U.S. companies use RSAs a lot. So, how RSA works is that you know a number of uh, shares are awarded to uh, an early stage employee or be, be it an advisor at early stage. And these still have the vesting curve, right? It could still have a four year vesting curve, but those stock award or those shares are given to you uh, as an employee or an advisor upfront. That is what RSA does, right? And similar thing with RSU, right? With RSU, unlike stock options, they, they, there is no exercise, right? So as soon as the you know um, options vest with you, they are given to you immediately, right? So there's no uh, concept of exercise. You don't need to pay the extra money or you know go through the whole exercise process uh, like you do in terms of you know stock options. So that way there is a subtle difference in terms of how RSAs and RSQ work, but they are again pretty common uh, in terms of US. Uh, when we talk about the cash-based incentive plans, uh, I think R, uh, SAR, that is stock appreciation rights, as it is called in India. Another term you might have heard uh, very frequently is a phantom stock, right? These are nothing but cash-based uh, incentive mechanisms where the employee doesn't get shares, never get shares, right? He gets equivalent amount of cash. They are linked to the shares, uh, share price at the end of the day, but the payout uh, to the to the employee happens purely in terms of cash, right? So th these are called phantom stocks and SAR. Um, just to make sure that all of you understand that term before we get into more detail. Uh, I hope, uh, you know, um, in terms of grants, ESOP grants, the vesting of grants, exercise of grants, those terms are clear for you. 
but at a high level let us say if i am giving a grant of 100 options and i give a four year annual vesting curve at the end of every year the employee is going to have the you know power or the uh, you know um, ability to exercise 25 options and therefore he can get 25 shares so that is how vesting works right uh, and the the fact that they can exercise and get the share uh, at a certain price that is called the exercise price uh, you also have this concept of performance grants or performance based vesting where every vesting is linked to certain performance criteria so if the employee is able to meet that particular criteria he gets that vesting otherwise uh, you know uh, he may not get or he may get a reduced vesting so that is uh, up to the management and you know hr to uh, do that appraisal for the employee and decide how much vesting he gets so these are some of the basic terms uh, did i miss anything narayan would you want to comment and uh, any specific terms that uh, you would want founders to understand before we dive deeper grant term grant term sure and and liquidation okay okay and employee exits because uh, three are important part of the life cycle right right so uh, in terms of liquidity options i think uh, most of the times the very uh, you know common liquidity option for employees would be at the time of ipo and mna right but those are like very far fetched typically right so therefore uh, it is it is more common nowadays you might have seen that founders and company or in startups are structuring specific liquidity events uh, on a regular basis or rather very much earlier than the ipo cycles right and allowing employees to have an option to liquidate part of their vested options right and these can be through buybacks these can be through secondaries and these secondaries could be one of secondaries where new investors are actually coming in buying those vested options or these could be secondaries that are having in conjunction with your primary fund raise right so both kind of uh, ways uh, you know you could have your um, liquidity uh, available right uh in terms of employees exits i think that is a very important point that narayan talked about uh you know exits are very common or rather you know uh, in advertent right i mean employees do exit uh even if they have worked in a company for 4 5 years and exit you want to make sure that uh, you know your terms are you know uh, favorable or employee friendly so that they are allowed to keep their vested options for a longer period of time you know a common uh, uh, pattern i have seen is allowing employees to exercise any time in the future at any liquidity event that you know occurs in the future uh, or you give them a long enough period of time to allow them to exercise that that could be another approach as well uh, in terms of grant terms uh, you know uh, uh, would it be exercise price vesting period what else uh, would you want to um, address narayan i think that's good that's good that's okay. okay all right so uh, i will get deeper into uh, you know more specific questions here or more specific areas of uh, interest to founders let me ask narayan you know since he has worked with so many startups you know at axel and even earlier uh, you know how do founders at early stage uh, you know use esops uh, to attract top talent right uh, of course at early stage uh, cash is at premium right are they successful you know in in indian environment are the founders successful in using esops as a tool to attract top talent are uh, have you seen cases where it actually fails right or does it work most of the time love to hear your experiences that founders can draw upon right wonderful uh, thanks ajay uh, like we all believe uh, startups are an evolution which means you know they grow from 0 to and uh, to the power of n now in the growth of uh, from 0 to the power of n what about tools we can use uh, to attract retain and create wealth for professionals you know who put their sweat and blood uh, during the journey uh, is important so one of those tool uh, in 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 my mind is equity uh, employee stock option uh, plan which constitutes uh, like sanjay said Uh, employee stock options, uh, RSUs. Then uh, we have uh, SARs and Phantom stock. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of it. Uh, but the most important for early stage founder, what they need to understand is they need to believe in something, you know, before they offer it to the employee. Now, what does that largely mean? Is 
let's take a simple example if i am the founder today and and you know i have an idea to go back and create a business out of my idea that's the first step and when the idea is being uh, executed i am quite clear that you know how am i going to execute the idea how am i going to make it big and what's the importance of market share these are very fundamentals to any startup before you start something you think about it right what is the kind of problem i'm solving is there enough market share for it and what is the growth i'm going to see and these are quite nominal or fundamentals or first principles you know for any startup founder to think about now in the same way uh, uh, one practice which is clearly essential and important in the long term visibility of the company is equity everything could evolve what i mean to say uh, your hr practices could evolve the way you strategize your financial uh, 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 fundraise could evolve but the most important thing is equity once you create an equity plan it needs to sustain at least for a minimum period of 5 years you know that's the basic term rule you know keep it keep it keep it constant don't keep changing or don't keep uh, 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 modifying the esop plan because you know you're going to hit uh, and you know clear uh, uh, create and create a balance for the employee already been working with so in that approach and line of sa- uh, side startup founders need to ke- uh, keep two things in mind in the same aspect of how do you think that you know there's a market gap for it create a model let's say let's take a simple example as i said i'm a founder i plan to start something on my own and i know for sure today the value of my company is uh, uh, in a, a, a x or a y amount right now there are a lot of modeling tools available online i want founders to start thinking and saying hey, okay now today uh, uh, the valuation which i think from a company perspective what i feel don't go back and look at what the investors are looking at or don't look at what the actuarial uh, valuation does look at from your perspective okay first is the foremost important thing is to create a model right now what does this mental model does is it gives you your perspective and visibility into how your company is also going to acquire your market share or what you think and what you believe was important right now while you are doing that you are also going to go back and say i think by the end of one year from x i think and i'm going to be x plus 2 i think from uh, after the one year that means you know i'm going to be x plus 2 plus i'm going to be x plus 5 so create a model and start creating your own notional value of your company or a unit now what does that give you that gives you a visibility into a plan of what is your approach now that's a very powerful model or a methodology to go back and talk to your new hires today many a times what founders do is you know they, they have a great idea they, all that they do is they go back and talk to someone and say hey you know what uh, uh, you know i want you to come and work for me but as human beings from the behavioral science background all of us need to know where exactly i'm going to be in you know what would be the benchmark range of money i'm going to make at the end of third or the fourth year if a founder can give that visibility to a new hire that means the founder has done a good job uh in creating awareness of where the company is going to grow in the next 2 to 3 years it's not about equity it's about taking the company from x to y that visibility is also being available and offered to an employee so please create this awareness through a modeling technique uh and go as much as up to 2 to 3 years so that you are giving some visibility for someone who is living a job who is a fresher uh coming and working and joining uh, uh working with you so that he knows at the end of the year you know what he makes and keep the constant communication on on where the company is uh, very simple steps once you do the modeling and keep reiterating the model uh, in every 3 months just to make sure that you know you are in touch with the market of where the company is moving and also internally on how your equity plan is evolving and keep your communication on how the company is evolving through equity to an employee so that you know he really understands uh, what money he is going to make at the end of second or third year it's one of the important factors it's just not on paper it's also on the community. okay thanks narayan and uh, have you seen uh, this kind of uh, approach of using esops uh, to uh, attract uh, you know good talent working most of the time for early stage companies or are there times when you know you must have had toxic founders who are unable to attract you know employees or good employees because they mostly want cash or some of them do want uh, cash right what are your thoughts uh, on those Uh, Sanjay, the scenarios are multifold here. Let's right. take uh, uh, an example of a single founder. Now he needs to build a founding team which needs to be strong. So the only leverage or the only tool which he has is equity. Okay. 
now let's look at another example of a found uh, of a founding team where there are five co-founders. Okay, right? now five co-founders now uh, and the equity available to them is going to be very very small. Now they can't use equity to attract as much than cash. Now if if all the five founders uh, you know, as a strategy, adopt and say, okay, fine, we're going to use equity as a, uh, as a pattern or a parameter to attract, then it's a different approach. But what I'm saying is, it's, there needs to be availability of resources to give it to someone. Now, a single founder has got a lot of resources to give because you know, he needs to build a co-founding team or a founding team to go build his company. But a five founder uh, uh, a founding team, their equity availability is very less. So hence, at that point of time, what they would do is they probably would not adopt the equity strategy at the very early on uh, uh, because they think that you know their hands are full while each founder looking at different responsibility, tech, product, operations, finance, uh, all of them while they're taking, they don't see an immediate need of getting an external person to come in and perform until they get their product market fit or close to getting their product market fit. Right. Mm -hmm. So after some time is when they would adopt an equity plan, when they, when they go to market at growth, to bring in uh, uh, senior members into the organization. Right. So it, it, it varies uh, based on the founder's need. Right. So if I understand a one person or two person founding team uh, would probably be much better placed in terms of using ESOPs to you know get some of the senior folks uh, join into the company, right? Through and using ESOPs as a tool. True, very true. And early stage founders don't need uh, uh, specialists. They would need journalists uh, who probably would uh, come in and complement you know, what they need. Let's say right. if there is a business guy who's going to start the company, probably he or she would need a, a CTO or, or a product person in order to come in and, and be a co-founder or a co-founding team. right? Uh, so then they could live with. While, while the five-member uh, 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 founding uh, team, everyone would coexist with one another, so hence they would not need any resources because they are all generally trying to see you know, what they could achieve. Right, right. Thanks, Narayan. Uh, one of the other interesting, you know, um, topics that I'm hearing uh, among the founders is the stock appreciation rights or phantom mm -hmm. stocks uh, mm -hmm. plan, right? Where it is a cash-based incentives, like I talked about. Do you mm -hmm. see this, uh, you know, getting discussed or getting, uh, you know, uh, adopted by founders at early stages? Uh, and what are your thoughts? How should founders approach this? Uh, in terms of uh, ESOPs, vis-a-vis, -vis, SAR, um, you know, kind of discussion, what would be the preferred model at the early stage uh, and why? Right. Uh, to answer your question, let me, let me split the uh, uh, organization growth or evolution into uh, three different steps, right? Early stage, uh, post-product market fit, and then growth. Or you can call it as uh, uh, formation, validation, and growth. Now, early stage founders, which is on the formation stage, would largely use ESOP, Employee Stock Option Plan, as a tool to go back and attract that. That's pretty clear, right? Now, the reason being is, we are only using modeling technique to go back and attract. And the kind of resources we need for an early stage company are also people who are uh, uh, largely uh, not senior, but uh, medium to junior kind of profiles is what most startups would need at a very early stage. They don't need specialists. They need generalists, probably who's got uh, moderate depth in the way they're going to bring value to the organization. Okay? So hence, it's going to be ESOP. Then moving on to uh, the validation stage, that's the product market fit. Uh, and, and that stage is when the organization would start to, uh, or the startup would not need to start thinking of bringing in RSUs uh, largely if they're a global company, right? Now, to give you an example, if a SaaS company has to go to the US and uh, strategically, if they know they want to set up an office uh, in, the, in, in San Francisco. Now, we all know how expensive it is for us to you know, set up an office in San Francisco, okay? Uh, now, at that point in time, uh, the ability to attract talent would largely become uh, becomes a very important thing. So here I'm going to use RSU. If I go back and say I'm going to give equity, they would not be interested. So I'm going to use RSU as a tool to go back and attract at product market fit or growth stage uh, or, or a validation stage. Now coming back to growth stage, 
Now there you need super speciality guys, you know, probably whose uh, whose mind data of a million records, uh, or probably who who is a DevOps person uh, who who has managed uh, a million transaction per second. These are specialists, you know, very few who are available. And for them, all that they need is incentivization, motivation to make sure that you know they come in and help solve a specific problem, right? So at that point in time is where you need to bring in uh, SARS or phantom stock as a methodology because for them they're not really interested in whether company they're going to come in and solve a problem and then move away from it, right? So but you need to incentivize to make sure that you know they keep coming back. So the strategy which you adopt is uh, you know what is your key talent? What is the speciality you need to bring in? And use all the four, or probably use one uh, effectively, and you can design it the way you want it. Now, let me spend a couple of uh, uh, minutes here talking about design. Uh, many a times, what founders think is, okay, equity is a plan. I, uh, you know, all that I can do is I can send an email uh, to an early stage employee, and then uh, think that I have given him equity. Please don't do that. The reason I would request you guys is. Have a design thinking approach specifically for equity. This is one program which cuts across all the three stages of your companies. While people might come and go, uh, while your policies might evolve, while your strategies might evolve, with, uh, you know, during all the three stages of the company, but equity plan is available for the entire grant term. And as per industry best practice, the grant term is ten years. So if you think that you know uh, you've created an equity plan. And I would go back, and I would go back and ask you to answer yourself: Would that program sustain for a minimum period of ten years? Okay, because all your early stage employees know who believed in your vision come back and join you as an organization, and if they don't see that you are monetizing them, they will feel very upset about it because they put their blood and sweat into it. Okay, so changing an equity plan at the middle of the program. Is one of the difficult tasks because you know going back to the board, you need to go back and recircle all your entire equity plan to all the employees who have been said within inside the organization. So considering that, preferably think about it from the design point of view as a ten-year plan. That means that once you create it, create it uh, and not as a foolproof mechanism, but include components, include method, include modeling as much to make sure that you know people get the best of it. Okay, I think that was uh, quite some insight in terms of and. uh advice in terms of how do you structure and you know design for long term design your esop plan for long term and you also covered how do you uh, you know when when is a good time to cover phantom stocks or uh, uh sar kind of cash based incentive plans into the mix i would ask you one more question before uh, you know i get into uh, answering questions from the from the um, uh, attendees Uh, there are a lot of questions coming in so it would be better if we uh, address them at the earliest but let me ask you one quick question before we jump into uh, you know questions from participants uh, one of the you know i was talking to uh, another um, uh, session and talking to some other founders where an interesting question came up right that we do uh, um, uh, esop grant to employees and that is mostly time based uh and no matter whether the employee is performing or not he still gets those esop uh, vested right what if i figure out that at the end of the year or two years the employee is just you know just stop performing he still gets those uh, options unless unless i fire him but he he is not that bad to you know let him go he's he's performing okay but he's still not performing the way i expected him to uh, give him those many uh, options so wh- how do founders approach this this is a kind of a, a big dilemma right uh it it sort of uh, esops versus performance based culture they, they seem to be kind of uh, becoming at conflict to each other you know that's quite interesting i observed oh, oh yeah uh, 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 as i said the more and more we start becoming for uh, performance oriented uh these are questions that which could come and there are very simple ways of doing this now uh now if the approach uh, of a founder now as i said you need to understand the context in which the company is uh, you know uh, being built the founder style the founder's approach these are very very important one simple request and advice is if someone has created a unique uh, stock option plan and they think it's going to work for you please don't uh, cut copy paste and build on it the reason being is your business is different your uh, your profit margins are different your markets are different your style of working is different so build a program specific to your context your business your revenue your profitability and your scale and that's an art 
Now to answer uh, your specific question, it is quite simple. Uh, if the founder has a performance oriented culture, the best thing I would recommend is use uh, RSU because what RSU does is uh, it is determined at a specific event or fulfilling a specific event. Right, which means to say, all that you can think of doing is uh, when a senior member is hired. To give you an example, in my in my previous years while I was managing global uh, organizations, we had RSU very clear. If Narayan does not perform uh, an event X or an event Y or fulfill his goal by X or Y particular date, then my RSU uh, would stop vesting or I won't get that cash reward because RSU is largely a cash dominated award because it's directly not linked to equity. It's the, it's the pricing point of view which RSU takes into consideration, right? Uh, so that, that's one way of looking at it. Use RSU. Or I have a classic example with one of my founders, you know, uh, he said, Narayan, and I would like to institutionalize on equity, on ESOP. So what we had done is we had created an a, a ESOP plan or an agreement clearly saying if an employee uh, in, his, in every year appraisal, he needs to be performing at met expectation. Only then the equity would best. Okay. Now, uh, in, in, on the, when the policy side, it was wonderful, uh, but the execution became a little difficult because what largely happens is when a company is, let's say, about 1,500 employees, when you don't have an ESOP tool, what, what would happen is you can't track it. Right. And someone uh, will have to go back into the tool and go back and make those changes. And once you forget for one, and just imagine the nine will, will, will start to uh, uh, make a story out of it. Now, if you have a very authentic, robust processes to make sure you have a mechanism to identify performers and not non-performers, and if you have a tool, whatever might be the tool, but make sure that you know it has a direct vesting link to the performance. And every every year, you need to have a, a performance appraisal date, and which is directly linked to it, and the rating directly linked to, uh, to it. And then you can have a clear mechanism. And that particular year, equity can stop this. But that should be indicated in the ESOP agreement which the employee signs. Got if the employee it. hasn't signed the ESOP agreement, if you go back and institutionalize performance, that means it's unfair practice. Got it. Glad that you brought up uh, the point of how uh, performance can be easily uh, you know, baked in into the grant uh, letter and, you know, initial grant to the employees and the agreement itself, uh, that makes it very easy. And just to add there, you know, we have a product uh, called mystartupequity.com built by Let's Venture itself, whereby the performance-based vesting is part of the product and it can be easily managed over hundreds and thousands of uh, employees uh, very easily and in a very compliant way. With that, I would... Uh, uh, ask Divyans to go ahead and uh, allow um, you know some of the participants to ask questions so that they can benefit from uh, you know Narayan's perspectives on those. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay, I think uh, you have uh, many of the questions. So can you please unmute yourself and uh, start having the discussion with panelists? I have given you the speaking permissions. Hi. Good evening, all. Good evening, Mr. Narayan. So, Mr. Narayan, we recently started a fintech company, three of us, mm -hmm. and uh, my questions are, uh, so it's it's been six months since we are working and we are almost ready with an MVP kind of product. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are looking to say hire a couple more people. Uh, we are all, uh, I'm completely bootstrapped by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's all bootstrapped. So if, if we need to hire some senior people, uh, how, how do we engage with them uh, as far as ESOPs or equity is concerned? Now, uh, senior, please, please define senior. Please. Uh, so I uh, let's say someone with 20 years of work X, whereas the existing founding team, all of them have uh, seven to eight years of work X each. And we are approaching right. someone who has around 15 to 20 years of work X. And mm -hmm. that would a stage when they are willing to come and say on a part-time basis. Mm -hmm. So how do you discuss uh, equity with uh, these senior people uh, when you are not in a position to really pay them? Okay. Now, uh, most importantly, uh, specifically at very early stage, uh, for the example which you're indicating or the state which you are in and the kind of people you're looking at it, 
uh, you need to first understand whether uh, the the new hire whom you are in conversation is he really have motivation to come in and join a startup and really add value to you first. Okay. Now let's say if if uh, the senior member has motivation, then the next important thing is what is the haircut on uh, on his current salary he or she is going to get. Okay. Uh, and, and you know you need to be very clear, very specific. The reason being is it's not about affordability; it's the motivation, uh, and it's the long-term play here, right? Uh, now, uh, once you identify the motivation exists, and you know he's clearly keen to take an haircut. Now, we we need to understand two important factors here. Uh, in the long-term uh, uh, engagement of this particular employee, okay. You need to go back and ask very fundamental question, uh, uh, which which I would ask is, uh, what is his current cost of living, and what does it take for him to be happy in the current stage? At what salary would he? Which means, uh, to give you an example, if someone is earning a seventy-five or an eighty lakh salary per annum, I would go back and ask him a question. Okay, now uh, I understand uh, based on the cost of living index available in India, I think someone with a twenty-five thirty lakh salary also should be able to live happy. Are you comfortable with the twenty-five or thirty lakh or forty lakh salary? My first step would be that. Okay, then uh, he will say yes, no. Okay, then you ask him the same question back again. Okay, no, tell me what is the money you know you would require uh, for you to be happy? Because you know we need to understand uh, the for him we need to take care of his cost of living. Right. If he if he go too much of a haircut, then after six months you know when he starts feeling the pain because he's going to start uh, taking away his savings, then he's not going to be happy. Okay. Then you will arrive at a number anywhere between forty or thirty or thirty between thirty to forty lakhs, and you will say forty thirty-five to forty lakhs is the salary which I am going to pay, and the rest forty lakhs of equity, based on the modeling what you have done, you need to offer it. All right, understood. And this forty lakhs would have four years vesting. Okay, which means that every year probably the company, if the value, I'm just taking an example, if the value of the stock uh, is forty lakhs, and uh, and uh, which means at the end of uh, the year one, the equity of ten lakhs, you know, which gets vested, probably would go up to twenty twenty five lakhs. At the end of the second year, the same ten lakhs worth of equity would go up to thirty thirty five lakhs. Which means by the end of the fourth year, you yeah. should be able to make anywhere between one point two to one point eight CR. Uh, uh, which means you know the startup is done well, and the uh, and the uh, and, and the person. Uh, has really contributed to the value of the growth, and th that's a parameters in which I would look for when 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 I start plugging in the modeling. Sure, this helps. Yeah, Divyansh, uh, can we go over to the next question? Yeah. Uh, next, uh, we have Ritika. She has uh, two questions. So, Ritika, can you please go ahead? Sure. Uh, hi, guys. Good evening. Uh, so, uh, with my organization, we guys are into three years uh, running. and uh, for this uh, for this appraisal cycle we guys were thinking about uh, a buyback option for all the employees so i just wanted to know how frequently can we do a buyback from the employees and will there be any implications from the irs will they have any questions for us that why this is being done or uh, can we do it as frequently as possible uh i think a good question the most important thing is uh VCs, I don't know. I work for a VC, but uh, uh, the most important thing, I'm not very sure VCs would be interested to, uh, you know, shell out money but too much on the employee equity buyback, but look for a secondary or a primary buyback. That's one part. Uh, as part of the company policy, I'm not very sure. Uh, uh, it's largely company policy defined. If you say every year you want a buyback policy, that's a policy which the company uh, has done. Not as much as uh, what. Uh, the irs is defining it if you believe that's good for your business if you think that's good for the viability of attracting attract, attracting and retaining talent feel free to have you can have 6 months 1 year i can give an example uh, 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 if uh, i think this was way back uh, in in the early uh, uh, 90s or uh, 2000 saskin uh, now a public listed company while they were not public uh, they had a beautiful equity program and what they had done is they they had opened it for any employee to buy back uh, a resigned employee's equity uh, at a certain cost so as i said you can be as creative as you want uh, uh, from from the equity planning uh, perspective uh, so so with that in mind uh, utilizing the beholders as you can have a six months the one year or a couple of year buy back uh, this left to you uh, based on uh, the investors and uh, the company policy 
Yeah, good. I, I think you gave a very good uh, option also. Yeah, just to add to what Narayan said, you know, uh, there are multiple options here like uh, buyback or a secondary uh, from incoming investors uh, or secondary along with the primary infusion, right? So you can look at all, all these two, three alternatives and, you know, uh, including the innovative option of allowing existing employees to uh, buy from leaving employees. So there are many options at play here. Right. Thanks, uh, guys. I just have one more question. Uh, so for us, the 409A happens every February uh, each year. Mm -hmm. And we guys give increments in April's, uh, mm -hmm. in April. So a, a few of our employees uh, have actually questioned us that uh, when we guys give out ESOPs, uh, along with the increment cycle, uh, those guys feel that they are not being paid enough because, or they are not being compensated enough because uh, in February only the fair market price or the exercise price according to the 409A increases. And then we give them ESOPs on the increased price. And uh, they feel that from the last April till February, they have worked uh, hard enough and they should be compensated on the last uh, you know, value. So how do we look at that? See, uh, there are multiple ways of looking at this uh, here. One, uh, in, in my mind and observation, uh, the, the preceding value of the organization would not change considerably uh, uh, in two months, from February to March. Sorry, February to April, one, right? Now, uh, uh, even if there is a change, what you could think of doing is probably in February when you give or in April you give equity options to the employee, you, you don't give them, let's say in, in the earlier plan you were supposed to give them 10, give them 11 or 12 uh, units, the additional one or two units is a markup for the price. Understood. Okay. So as I said, you can be as creative as it is or what you can do is if, if you think that you know, four, uh, uh, if you think uh, the organization is scaling faster and the value of equity is much more higher. Uh, and if there's a possibility to go back and get your uh, valuation of 409k uh, uh, done in April so that it uh, coincides with your equity vesting, that's also another possibility. Understood. So basically backtrack and back calculate the entire amount and then give it out to the employees. Yeah. Might yeah. just work. All right. Great. Thanks, guys. These were the two yeah. questions that I had. Thanks, Ritika. Uh, next, we have Venkat Raman Rao. Uh, he has a couple of questions for you. Uh, Venkat, can you please unmute yourself? Hey, Venkat, how are you? Uh, hi. Hi, very good, Narayan. How are you doing? Doing well, Venkat. Good to see you. Good to see you. And uh, of course, I can ask you separately but as an Excel portfolio company, but, but uh, some of these are maybe interesting for everyone. So uh, we spoke of, uh, you know, how you model if it is a critical employee or somebody who is uh, you know, whom you are hiring as an early startup. But let's say you're trying to create a ESO plan for a more regular hire. What mm -hmm. percentage of salary would you recommend as, you know, percentage available for ESOPs? Means if you can design something like that. What have you seen people do and what has worked well? Uh, that's one question. Uh, there is a second question uh, where, you know, I've seen some employee uh, organization give the option to critical employees or even to the wider uh, workforce saying that you can take 10% of your salary as, you know, you can uh, take it for ESOPs. What do you think of the model? Is it a good model? What is your views on it? I have one or two other questions in terms of buyback. We'll come to that. Got it. Okay. Now, uh, equity ranges uh, are largely part of the business plan. Consumer companies uh, uh, versus SaaS companies. Uh, when, what I can uh, indicate is uh, based on uh, the research, which I think I did about a uh, year, year, year and a half back uh, with about 60, 65 of our own companies and companies outside of India, 0.2x uh, to 6.5x of the fixed salary could be your equity. Okay. Now, 0.2x can be for an early stage. Uh, uh, what I mean to say is uh, a, a SD1 or a software engineer one uh, six to six point five x of the salary could be for someone like a, a very critical vice president uh, of a product company, or a sales driven organization, or a sales guy, or even it could be a CEO six point five x of a, a salary of equity could be the equity range. Okay, now that's that's quite interesting. So that's why obviously a wide range, but then what we are saying is 
you know if you're doing people with three uh, you know the the bulk of where you hire in the middle uh, experience force you possibly will do a 0.5 to 2x kind of thing very critical okay. hire goes all the way to 6x okay fair yes thank you yeah and, and the and second then, one in terms of taking the esops as part of salary giving the option to people to create that culture so have you seen people trying it as it work oh yes uh, if you go back and see uh, during the uh, covid times uh, some of the companies uh, during their performance appraisals went back and said hey you know what uh, uh, you've done well uh, as part of the company policy you know there are two ways of looking at it you can take a cash component of a monthly increase of x and the equivalent of that per annum would cost us this uh, equivalent of that particular cost value of an annum uh, we are willing to give you an equity uh, would uh, would you be interested Uh, I can't name the company. Yeah, yes, there are companies who have done that. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the company did very well. You know, because most of the employees uh, uh, believed in the company, believed in the philosophy of the company, and and uh, uh, took the equity as compared to uh, the cash. Okay, great. And uh, this, uh, see, the I think Cisco tried this where you actually can uh, do a variable. If you want, you know, means where you have the option. And literally each month saying i'll take up a, you know 1% of my salary 5% of my salary as each of this month again i i haven't seen the results of it but uh, sounds very interesting to me uh, just again means any thoughts on that possibly uh, uh, have you seen people try like that uh, venkat what you're talking about is the stock purchase plan for a public listed company what you can do is the company can have uh, uh, multiple cycles of uh, uh, purchase which means uh let's say i'm working in a company x and and what i can do is i can give uh, i can be part of the stock purchase plan where i'll go back and say 10% 15% or 20% of my salary every month uh, i would like to earmark uh, and cut it and you know please translate that into equity at the end of the sixth month which means that a company is going to hold uh, uh 10% 10% 10% 10% for the next six months and whatever might be the cumulative amount you know which the company has held from me they're going to be uh, giving equity worth at that point in time at a 10 or 15% equity discount so that possibility exists uh, if you have a, a public listed company and if you're quite uh, well sure about the pricing methodology and if you have uh, indicated as part of the esop plan in it okay fair enough no uh, yeah i mean uh, uh, possibly a separate discussion uh, narayan uh, what i was also thinking is can i structure something for esops as well okay I means where people can take his ops instead of salary as a variable percentage depending on their own interest yeah so, so, so just, saying, fix. okay yeah j- just to add to uh, what narayan said venkat uh, yes pp exact equivalent we have not seen in the private uh, space private company space but uh, mm-hmm. you know like narayan said you know at the beginning of the appraisal cycle or at the beginning of the you know year you can definitely year mark a certain percentage of the salary or increase of the salary and give them equivalent ease of that is is a relatively more common uh, but on a month mm-hmm. month by month basis uh, equivalent to what espp does for public companies that is uh, something i have never seen not common okay yes. fair enough and uh, by that typically i think uh, we touched upon it if i were if you are doing liquidity events and creating the buyback uh, of uh, esops is it typically uh, what would be the valuation uh, at which you do any rule of thumb because the the valuation at which the founder raises money is a little different from what i could potentially sell uh, there we have seen at a discounted rate now that discounted rate of secondary could vary from who the investor is at what value he is willing to come in uh, so that's separate that's a, that's a conversation between the investors and the board they would decide on the price uh and and it's always at a discounted price that what discount that would start anywhere between at 5% and go up to uh 15 to 25% at uh, uh discounted price okay that's 5 to 5, 5 to 25% fair enough i've got yeah, my answer yeah. okay perfect thanks narad yeah thanks thanks venkat uh next we have uh, rangaraj uh he has couple of questions for you hey narad how, how are you um uh, yet another of of your excel portfolio companies but a uh, couple of questions one is uh, for advisory board members uh, you know we always talked about employees but uh, any suggestions on what the expectation is and would it come out of the esop pool or would it come out of any other 
uh, for advisory board members? Uh, ideally, uh, I, uh, if uh, in the initial stage, if I would have factored, uh, now uh, this is something which I said at the early, uh, in your design itself, if you think that you know, it's for employees, contractors, advisors, and all of them, and uh, indicate what tools we are going to use or what methodology you're going to use. Yeah, you're going to use ESOP, RSU, Phantom Stock, or SARS, right? Then what happens is that you have the liberty to offer uh, uh, RSUs or a Phantom Stock for advisors. Okay. Many times, you know, they would not be eligible for equity, ESOP, because okay. they're not an employee. And, and there are some Indian tax regulations which would not allow you to uh, offer equity uh, to... No, this uh, is more for US-based uh, companies. So, uh, mine's a Delaware, uh, Tascom is more Delaware company. So, um, it's uh, completely US. Uh, uh, it, it's possible. You can you can offer them RSUs or uh, equity for uh, for them. Now, in terms of uh, structuring them, and now considering uh, uh, their value uh, and uh, uh, the kind of position which they are in now, to give you an example, if the advisor is largely focused on bringing in revenue to the organization, mm. right, uh, or bringing in opening up doors for uh, sales conversations or for uh, closing the deal, mm -hmm. right, uh, then uh, the cash compensation is going to be lesser, the equity compensation is going to be higher. Here, there, the trends which we have seen is anywhere between uh, two to three x of the cash compensation based on meeting the milestones. Okay. And uh, for sales guys, uh, it seems like RSU is kind of uh, well suited based on performance guidelines, but uh, how is it different from typical variable pay uh, mechanisms on salary? What's the difference? Okay. And now uh, variable pay uh, is a cash component. Now there, uh, it, it's performance driven. One. Now RSU is a, a milestone driven. Okay. To give you an example, now when I go hire an employee or when we go hire an employee, as part of the conversation, what we would tell them is, I'm going to give you X amount of cash and X amount of uh, X percentage of variable. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, uh, now, for all your employment agreement, these two are very important pieces for conversation, which is gross compensation or base compensation and variable. Now, equity is a separate alignment document which clearly says you will be offered X or Y percentage of equity based on meeting a certain milestone. Now, you, you can offer variable fee based on the performance, but if the employee is there on the milestone date and if it is not linked to the performance, then he or she would be eligible for uh, the RSU vesting or exercising at that point in time. So, milestones are more by date rather than... Or... Or, or is, but it's not saying that if you meet a, um, um, if we cross a million dollars, then this would be, or if you cross ten million dollars, this would be this, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can include that uh, if you are uh, quite thoughtful in the beginning of creating an RSU plan for that particular employee. Okay. When when you make an RSU agreement, that's what we, we spoke about uh, in the early run, guys. Uh, let's say you are hiring me. And you uh, you want to keep the operating expenses low. So what you're going to do is you're going to focus more on the equities and the RSUs of the world and 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 less of cash. So I mean you're going to say uh, one year you're going to bring me 10 million revenue only then you're going to meet the milestone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Nair. Yeah. Catch yeah. Up Just later. to add there, Ranga. I mean RSUs are perfect tool uh, for long-term incentives of uh, employees. And you can use a uh, term-based as well as performance-based criteria and bake that in into your uh, agreement from day one. And uh, all that could be managed, uh, you know, to like my startup equity or, or something like that, where uh, these criteria can be easily mapped uh, at the end of the term and the employee gets a transparent view of what he's going to get, uh, how many options are going to get vested uh, when the RSU uh, kind of uh, vesting happens. Thanks. Okay, okay. Divyansh, next one. Uh, next, we have Sachin Kesarwan. He has a couple of questions. Sachin, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Hi, Mr. Naran. Hi, Mr. Sanjay. I have a few questions uh, regarding this. Uh, if the company having the pool of ESOP and during that pool, uh, if they decided to 
uh, move on to make a e shop trust so how we proceed on that part so we have to take it pool as a separate and e shop trust as a separate or we have to combine them can i take that question narayan sure sure go ahead yeah so sachin uh, we have uh, got this question a few times and we have not seen very many uh, cases when startups uh, you know are using a trust route to manage the arisa pool uh, and most of the companies manage the arisa pool uh, internally uh, by their own uh, uh, teams uh, having a arisa trust uh, uh, adds a lot of complexity in terms of accounting compliance and you know managing a separate entity etc and therefore we have not seen very many companies use it uh, among the 200 companies we are you know helping at my startup equity i would say you know not more than few uh, you know single digit numbers would be using uh, uh, would be using esop trust route okay. okay does that answer your question yes thanks thanks sanjay okay next one divyans uh, we have rupsi she has two questions rupsi can you please uh, unmute yourself yeah hi everyone so uh, my first question is uh, can we have a period lesser than 1 year for a milestone grant like as i know there should be at least one year period of, period of vesting in case of uh, in ca- in india as well as in delaware as too and we want to uh, restrict our milestone vesting for lesser than a, pe- uh, a year period can that be done i can take that question as well um, uh, so rupsi uh, yes uh, you know as you rightly said in india there is a minimum 12 month uh, uh, vesting uh, requirement right uh, but in us uh, there is us singapore there is no such uh, mandatory requirement so you are allowed to vest the first uh, vesting uh, you know even lesser than 12 month so be it even next day it can vest so that is no limitation in delaware companies okay and won't uh, since fema regulates the esops also and it says that the policy should be a global policy so making it different from the indian employees and for the us employees i think should not work here no there is no such uh, because uh, in in case you are a delaware registered company and your indian employees will also receive uh, you know uh, esops uh, from the delaware entity directly uh we have not come across any such limitations that would be imposed on the indian employees uh, which which will be different than what would be for the delaware entity narayan happy to uh, see if you have any different thoughts uh, that is uh, rupsi most important is you know your the parent organization in the us and uh, india is a subsidiary uh, yeah. and your cap table what you're going to use is largely from the us uh, so the equity pool which is coming in to the india employees is from the cap table of the us or the parent company So considering that the connection is very well established for the parent and the subsidiary, uh, so uh, the regulations, uh, uh, as Sanjay said, would would uh, affect the group. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my next question was in relation to escrow account. So uh, we are kind of changing our plan, making some amendment therein, and the we have been suggested that we should have a escrow for our ESOPs. So, so whenever there is a share allotted to the employee, it will park in the escrow till the time of liquidity, and only on liquidity it will be released. So, just wanted to check whether this will be beneficial for our company or not. Yeah. So, um, Rupsi, in terms of uh, you know employee holding shares and how, what are the various ways you can uh, restrict that? Uh, of course, the first and foremost, you can have. transfer restrictions baked into into your esop plan uh, at the very beginning so that employees have certain restrictions in terms of how, what they can do and what they cannot do with those shares that aside you know uh, you know definitely there are different ways uh, companies uh, uh, want to limit how uh, employees are able to exercise and get the shares in their hand in the first place right uh, one of the popular one uh, approach i have seen is allowing employees to uh exercise their shares at liquidity event only right so that sort of limits uh them and uh, uh they are allowed then to exercise at the same time and sell those shares it benefits the employees as well in the sense that uh, uh employees are able to don't have to pay exercise tax from their pocket 
they are able to use the proceeds from the sale and pay the exercise tax and for the company also it is a benefit that they don't have to manage with this extra shareholder coming onto the cap table right uh, and other such mechanisms like for example you know having uh, some sort of poa uh, you know and some sort of escrow account those are little bit complex approaches but yes those can be looked into uh, uh, I, i would not i mean i would not go into much more details of those though. okay so in nutshell i can uh, opine from what you have just uh, told me that it could be complex but that could be helpful for the company as well yes you could uh, look into it and uh, you know talk to you can uh, connect with me offline and maybe you can discuss uh, uh, exactly your case uh, separately all right thank you thanks loops uh we have punrit he has an interesting question where uh, he is comparing early stage startups with uh giants like amazon and flipkart so punrit can you please go ahead punrit can you please unmute yourself okay uh any more questions do we have uh, divyansh uh we do have but i don't think we are left with any time and uh, let me take a couple of questions you know uh, uh, sanjay from the question bank now sure. during investing period if the company wants to set up piece of trust then how will they proceed we spoke about it then uh, prashant uh, i think the firm is there a trend or a norm on what percentage of total equity should be reserved for ease of a uh, global companies uh, earlier uh, we were saying anywhere between 10 to 12% considering uh, talent is becoming uh, the bottleneck for success uh, now the average of uh, a percentage of pool uh, is anywhere between 12 to 15% uh, either it is uh, a global company or an indian company would, we would suggest uh, founders to earmark 12 to 15% for uh, a good ease of pool now considering uh, there will be multiple founders in that approach uh it could be anywhere between uh 10 to 12% uh but anything you know more than 10 is a good ease of uh, uh pool which the founder should be earmark uh, for scale and growth now you might not see the benefits of it but in scale and growth you really see uh, a great value and benefit from it. uh then equity diversity in uh foundation team uh naman says is there a rule of thumb to approach how much equity to diversity in early stage for building the foundation team now this is quite tricky uh, the reason being is if the founder is a business person and uh, and is and it's a tech product uh, or a tech enabled product a uh, uh, tech enabled company which means you know your uh, need to have a strong founder or a co-founder uh, with technology background is very important uh, so in that approach uh, it could it's very important and some group could go up from anywhere between uh one to five percent at very early stage when i say very early stage during the ideation stage uh and sometimes if uh and, and, and during negotiations and conversation we've seen it go up to uh equals and go up to maximum of 10 percent so uh as i said it's quite variable uh based on the need of the business based on the founders uh need and based on uh, uh the person to be on the founding team uh, uh presentation it, it varies uh now joystick said while hiring a co-founder how early would you allocate equity through vesting uh would they be allocated from day one for achieving some no he's a co-founder he's already taken the risk of coming on board uh, what more measurements do you need for an, uh, for for, uh, for your partner now uh, one request and one recommendation is when you when you think that you're going to get married to someone as a co-founder uh stop asking questions you know please uh, treat them as equals because that's when uh, uh you know marriage would work uh it's not employment uh, i would say co-founding teams are like managers yeah i think you know you know okay i think lastly uh, maybe i will add one more question uh, to you um, uh, and ryan is i guess ease of buybacks are pretty much talked about in the media almost every day uh, how do you approach ease of buybacks you know at uh, uh, do you i think there was a question around you know do i you know uh, do this every six months or a year i think ritika or uh, somebody asked that question do i spend money from my balance sheet to be able to do that or do i get secondary investors to uh, you know 
uh, buy those uh, ESOPs from employees. What are the kind of rule of thumbs? Do you allow it for everybody? Do you allow it for only senior people? Or you know, is there is there some certain percentages that you allow that you cannot uh, you know sell more than ten percent of your vested options? Uh, what are the practices that you have seen? Because you know, there are a lot of uh, companies in Axel portfolio would have gone through buybacks as well as secondaries. Uh, you know, perspectives on these would definitely help some of the growth stage founders, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this particular uh, participant list, right? All right. Uh, now, so, so buyback is, is the flavor of the season, and I think it's going to stay for a long period of time. And, and I wish it continues as much because uh, startups need to uh, prove uh, to, uh, to themselves and to their employees that, you know, there's a possibility to monetize, make money, and create money. A couple of things, you know, need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, when you're designing the policy, as I said earlier, during the grand term period, in your mind, be prepared uh, at the end of the third or the fourth year, if the company is done well, if they have their MVP, if they have their product market fit uh, at the second, second or third year, that means at the end of the fourth year, they would be raising the Series B or a Series C fund, right? If, they, if they're not bootstrapped. Uh, and, and that's an ideal time because what happens is, uh, people who have worked the last four years to uh, to bring the company from zero to uh, the MVP or the product market fit stage is a time for uh, them to be rewarded, right? And and, uh, and and which means you know that's being fair and being nice and being uh, uh, encouraging the employees to come back. So I would uh, uh, you know design it in such a way that you know uh, keep it as a milestone for secondary buyback and the cap table. Both need to complement one another. Which means, you know, if someone is coming in uh, and the founder is going back and having a conversation with investors about equity buyback as a secondary, uh, is something the founders need to be quite savvy enough in having those conversations. Uh, and then making sure that, you know, go back and look at, hey, my employees have struggled for the last four years. Uh, my comp strategy or the, my comp philosophy was 60% of the market and uh, they've not made money and they need to make sure that, you know, I need to give them opportunity. Two very important fundamental things. The, the next important thing is what percentage? Uh, now, uh, that largely is uh, a variable of uh, the founders and the value creators. Uh, it, 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 might be a, it might be an organization largely based on operation, which means that it's an operations heavy organization, right? Now, uh, while tech enabled could be a moderately lesser. Now, at that point in time, it's very hard to say you give the technology guy uh, more or the operations guy less, right? So you need to have a very balanced approach because uh, the guy who was in the operating world on the ground has really created a lot of impact uh, and then scaled the company. So at that point in time, it's a founder's call uh, to ensure that, you know, it is fair, it's appropriate, uh, that people who have contributed to the success from zero to four or uh, zero to four years need to be rewarded. Now, you can work backwards uh, because, you know, the investor would come and say, I'm going to buy back X or Y uh, percentage of value, and that could translate into a certain amount. Uh, and when you when you work backwards, you clearly have a, a roadmap or a model to go back and see what are those employees who would be eligible. And and in some of our companies, we have seen uh, when the opportunity was given them that you know we want to buy back, they came back and said you know you know we don't want to sell it now. We believe in the company's growth, so hence you know uh, we're just going to stay back uh, and not not buy back. So we need to create those opportunities too, being transparent, being fair, uh, so that. So the employees start believing in the organization. Thanks a lot, Narayan. I think it was very wonderful and insightful. I benefited a lot and I'm sure uh, so did founders. Uh, and lastly, I would like all the founders here in the, uh, in the participants to check out our product, mystartupequity.com. Uh, allows you to have your employees transparently view the ESOP worth, how it has grown and helps you with retention and uh, uh, of the uh, top talent that you used ESOP for in the first place, right? So do uh, check it out and let us know. We are always available for uh, answering any questions. Reach out to me at sanjay at letsventure.com. Thank you, Narayan, and thank you thank all. You. Yeah, bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Friday evening. Thank you.